kind of draw the line at seeing any part of your partner's genitalia. I don't do penises except for the penis that I do routinely do. So. Hello to all of you beautiful birthing people and welcome back to my channel. My name is Elizabeth. I am a labor and delivery nurse, certified childbirth educator, and mom of three. And today I I'm coming to you guys with a video that is highly requested and it is part two of my taboo topics surrounding labor, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. On my Instagram a few weeks ago, honestly probably about a month ago now, I asked you guys for some taboo or questions that you wouldn't be comfortable just asking so that we could answer those together because I feel that if we can kind of pull back the curtain and debunk myths and learn facts, we can make this whole process a lot less overwhelming and intimidating. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, so I'm gonna start with kind of a hard hitting and crazy one for you guys. Have you ever kicked out a dad slash birth partner? If so, why? Now I personally have never had to kick out or limit somebody from being in the birth space. And the only reason why I personally would do so is if they were causing harm or making things unsafe or if my patient aka the person giving birth was like i don't want them in here then they're gone but i have never had to do that thankfully knock on wood but i, def but I definitely have had co-workers who have had to do so the thing about labor and the thing about being a labor nurse that is so interesting and fascinating is that everybody comes into labor and delivery generally right to do the same thing to have a baby now their roads and routes to getting there might be different but the other thing that's also different is everybody's family situation and one thing that i do want to highlight on here is that we ask upon the time of arrival upon admission when my patient's in the bathroom maybe going to the bathroom or changing into a gown if that's their desire or somewhere that i can get them alone i i ask them you know do you feel safe at home and some people are kind of like, what? But it's a question that we are required to ask and it's a question that's important to ask because we know that abuse increases. Physical, emotional, mental, all of the abusive tendencies that we see increase when you're pregnant. You'd think pregnancy would make them go down and it doesn't. And homicide is a big killer of women when they are pregnant. So it's my job to make sure that you are safe. One of my jobs. I have had a partner have a big verbal altercation and leave it a huff on postpartum. My job in that situation was to make sure that mom and baby were doing well. My job in that situation was to make sure that they had a safe plan for discharge and to consult with case management. My job in that situation was to write a very, very detailed note in the chart as to what happened because a few months later, I ran into that mom in a store and she said, hey, you know, we're doing some court proceedings. And I said, if you get your records, you will have all the notes you need. So that's my job there, to keep everybody safe and to give appropriate resources. Here's another question. A friend of mine can't wear tampons after birth because they fall out. What can she do? So if you're having problems keeping in a tampon, keeping in a cup, or anything of that nature, right, that's supposed to go into the vagina and stay there for menstruation, go see a pelvic floor PT. You know, you know, you know. We talked a little bit last time about symptoms of a rectocele, but having things not be able to stay in could be a symptom of prolapse, could be a symptom of a weakened pelvic floor, could be a symptom of maybe a hyperactive pelvic floor where you can't really get it in far enough for it to, to stay. So definitely seek out a pelvic floor PT because some of these things that we think are quite common after you've had a baby, they're not normal so let's fix our pelvic floors together because let's fix it now so when we go through menopause and the estrogen is like that your pelvic floor doesn't go that wouldn't be good okay here's a good one masturbating during labor i've heard it makes things go better that's one question another one can clitoral stimulation help ease pain in labor for some women the answer to both of these is yes I know, you're like, Elizabeth, what? But here's what I will tell you. Clitoral stimulus, stimulating things externally, 
can definitely bring on oxytocin surges. Oxytocin surges can tell your uterus to have contractions. Contractions bring baby down and out. When we've got oxytocin flowing, 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 we've got endorphins flowing, flowing, flowing. So that orgasm mixed with those endorphins can definitely make things more pleasurable or manageable in labor. Another question I got was, have I ever seen an orgasmic birth? To my knowledge, I have not. But there may be people who have experienced them as I was their labor nurse that were kind of like, oh my gosh, what is this? Because it's not something that we often see in the hospital setting. For an orgasmic birth, we often need to feel super, super safe, super secure, super unwatched, all things that even in the very best hospital setting with your nurse here who's turning down the lights, who's putting up the sparkly lights, who's talking in hushed voices, it's just not the same as being at home. But I will say that masturbation particularly external masturbation because once your water's broken, we definitely don't want anything going inside the vagina, can be beneficial in labor and definitely something you can do at home. If you feel comfortable bringing that to the hospital, that's great, you do you. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not the person experiencing labor, okay? It's not something that I felt drawn to do as I got into more active labor, but if that is you, you do you. I did have a question. <laughs> Kind of going off of that one that I think is quite funny. Having sex in the L&D room, no reason why that can't happen. I don't think that having sex in the labor and delivery room would be the most beneficial for labor. Here's what I think. Cuddling, canoodling, maybe even some nipple stimulation from your partner if you're comfortable with that. All great things to make you feel loved, safe, supported, secure and release some oxytocin. But when we move past that into having sex, especially in a situation where you're like, somebody could walk in at any minute or X, Y, and Z, like you're not like in the moment of that, I don't feel like the areas of your brain that really need to be activated for labor are going to be activated because you're gonna be very, very nervous that somebody is going to walk in at any moment. You can't lock a labor room. Um, and as your labor nurse, I kind of draw the line at seeing any part of your partner's genitalia. That's not in my wheelhouse. I don't do penises except for the penis that I do routinely do. So, I'm glad my husband doesn't watch my videos because he really wouldn't like that. But I mean, like, honestly, like, as a nurse, the last time I saw an adult male penis, that was not a consensual relationship with my husband was like 10 years ago. So it's just, it's not for me. I love that for you. Let's do that at home. If your water's not broken, if there's even a thought, maybe my water's broken, external all the way, baby, because we wanna keep that baby safe in there. Okay, that's my answer. I, I <laughs> did have a coworker who walked in on this really, really young couple having sex in the labor room. And they were mortified. And when you're mortified, your sympathetic nervous system is going to be hit on. You're going to be fight or flight, and it's not going to do good for our labor hormones. So do what makes you feel comfortable. If you're like, Elizabeth, I don't want to masturbate in labor in the hospital, don't do it, right? We want you to feel comfortable. But if in the moment that's what you're drawn to, you do you. But I don't want to see anybody's penis. And that's a fact. Okay, let's jump away from sex because that was getting a little, a little hairy. <laughs> What do you do if someone wants to name their child something strange? Um, if they tell me that their baby is gonna be named Sheet, I'm looking at my unmade bed, then I say, oh, wow, that's a, that's a really unique name. Where did you come up with that? Awesome. I love that you love that name. That's gonna, they're not gonna have anyone in their class with that name. If you tell me, oh, so we're thinking we're gonna either name her Sheet or Sarah, Okay, tell me a little bit about like where those two names came from. Okay, yeah, I understand you're trying to be unique. I love that. Let me, see. but you know what? Sarah is a family name for you and I love family names. My kids all have family names. It's not one that's super common right now. So I feel like you've got that unique factor without her having to constantly have to spell it or explain it. So my votes for Sarah if you're taking votes, but obviously you do you, it's your baby's name. Guess what? It's not my opinion that matters. Will I snicker about it later? Maybe. If you name your baby Sheet, would it stick in my head? A hundred percent. 
but most of the time the names that are a little bit unique or different don't really faze me. I also am always, always trying to be very sensitive and that's why I love to ask about the history of the name or where they came up with the name. Culturally, there are names that I think are weird that are not my culture. So like, it's not my business if I think they're weird. I really always do try to get the spelling down of any name that is unique. I always really try to focus on learning the pronunciation of any name that is unique because my goal as your labor nurse, as your postpartum nurse, is to use your name, your partner's name, and your baby's name and not just call them baby and not call you mom and dad because that's weird for me to call another grown adult mom or dad. Like, I want to use your name. I want us to have that bond and that knowledge that you are a unique and individual human being. So that's what I do at the end of the day. It's not my business what they're naming their babies because it's not really anybody's business. And that's why a lot of people don't want to tell people what they're naming their babies because they don't want your opinion. Here is a question. What does the doctor use lube for? So we use lubrication uh, or vaginal lubricating jelly. Often it is a water-based gel that we will use on our fingers when we are doing a cervical examination so that we can easily go into the vagina without causing you any friction or discomfort. Sometimes your provider might use lubrication while you're pushing to help ease the baby's head out. Is this really evidence-based? Maybe not. Also, we make a lot of discharge, lube, blood, mucus, all this stuff to help ease the baby's head out. So I don't really know that that's incredibly necessary, but I do find that sometimes some providers want to be doing something. So they'll apply a little bit of lubrication or do a little bit of external massage on your perineum. If you don't want lubrication, put it in your birth plan, let them know. But with a cervical examination, it's definitely something that makes things feel way more comfortable. Here's a great question. Does my nurse have to stay in the bathroom with me while I go? Stage right here. So every nurse is gonna look at this differently, but if my goal is for you to be able to pee and you can't pee while I'm in there, then no. But here is what I am gonna do. I'm not gonna shut the door all the way and I am going to stand right outside the door and I'm gonna be like, if you feel dizzy or lightheaded, you need to let me know. And periodically I'll be like, hey, you doing okay in there? But yes, I understand a lot of people do have anxious or nervous bladders where they're not gonna be able to pee if somebody's watching them and I totally respect that. So I try and get them all situated in the toilet, um, have the water running, give them my spiel about how we can help make peeing a little bit easier and then give them space if they need it. But I can't guarantee that all nurses are going to be able to do that because we are very concerned about you passing out or falling off of the toilet. If you fall in labor, if you fall postpartum, if you fall in a hospital, it's a lot of paperwork and it's a big deal because falls are all technically preventable. So that's what we're trying to do is prevent a fall, but I'm also trying to not prevent you from being able to pee. So we got to weigh those two together. This one I'm going to answer and I'm going to answer just, this is like the first thing that pops into my head. I just thought it was like adorable and hilarious and just like really sweet. And this patient was, was fabulous. But, um, what is the most questionable thing you've seen someone do in labor? I'm sure you wanted something more scandalous than this, but this is just what pops into my head. I had a patient once who came in, she had done a bunch of research, was hoping and did have a beautiful unmedicated birth. She was a freaking rock star, delivered on hands and knees, just like kudos to her, it was her first baby. She came in because her water had broken and she, I think was also in early labor as well, but I can't remember. But when she came in, she said, my water has broken and I read online that sometimes it can be hard for you guys to glean or understand if the water's broken, which is true depending on where that break is, how much you're leaking, etc." And so what she did is she collected a fairly large like Tupperware container full of amniotic fluid for me to test. She said, I thought this might be helpful. I said, Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, you do not generally need to bring a Tupperware container full of amniotic fluid. If you are that grossly, and by the term grossly, I just mean very obviously ruptured, probably just a pad in your underwear will suffice. Um, you don't need to bring in your mucus plug in a bag. If you want to, I don't care. I'll look at it. Show me a picture. You know I want to see a picture, but not all nurses are like me. <laughs> Not everybody wants to see a picture, but we believe you and we trust you. And yeah, if you're 
having that much amniotic fluid, then you can just put a pad on and we can next in the pad. You do not need to put it in a Tupperware container. I'm going to answer one more question about poop because I think that it is something that we of course are always very anxious about in labor. So how do you know if you pooped on the table? You probably won't know because like I said in my last video, when you're pushing, it feels like you are just shitting out a giant brick. And I mean that in the most beautiful, joyous way possible because it really is a beauty and a joy to see your baby be born. Most of the time, if you poop, it's a very small amount that your nurse will wipe away. Partners, if you're watching this, keep it to yourself. If you think, oh, she just pooped. That's it. That's an in your head voice. That needs to say right up in here. We all saw it. We're all thinking it. We're all cleaning it up. My patient this past weekend, it was her second baby. She kind of stalled out at around three centimeters. I did some spinning baby stuff. I did sideline release on both sides. Then I put her in flying cowgirl. And then the fetal tracing, the baby was coming off the monitor with every contraction, which told me that baby's moving right on down in the pelvis. I went in there, we pulled back the sheet, and she had a little bit of small amount of stool on the bed, which told me, even before the doctor checked her, she's probably fully dilated. And she was, she was fully dilated and the baby was right there. So what did I do? Changed out her pad and we pushed it out of baby. She never knew that she pooped. You might smell something, but you also could potentially be passing a little bit of gas, so you might smell that as well. But don't worry about it. It is nothing we haven't seen before. I would say 50 to 75% of people might have a small poo in labor, and it's very small. And it tells us that you're pushing the right spot and that your baby's coming down. There's nothing you can do to control it. And I'm a poop ninja, so I have you. Anyway, I hope this video was fun and helpful. Definitely, if you have any other taboo questions, leave them down below. I definitely can do another Q&A over on my Instagram, so if you want to follow me over there. Um, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on this video to help with the algorithm. Until next time, bye guys!